What does a wolf's howl mean to you? Does it make you excited or perhaps wary? Go back just 10 generations and your ancestors may well have been living alongside wolves. Back 55 generations and they perhaps knew the elusive and mysterious lynx. And they might have encountered something even bigger in the forest. The brown bear. Now all these animals are gone from Britain, driven to extinction by the ultimate predator. Man. We have become accustomed to living in a countryside without other top predators. But do you feel that something might be missing? Many people do. For them, Britain is a dormant and incomplete landscape. There is now a compelling argument for the return of our missing mammals and huge potential for creating healthier ecosystems, enhancing our tourism economy and having areas of wilder, more exciting countryside as a consequence. But would you be willing to accept the challenges posed by the presence of these animals? The lynx is a beautiful, largely solitary ambush hunter. They present no real danger to humans, and in Scotland would be of little threat to livestock. There is plenty of habitat and wild prey for them, and the lynx could help to control roe deer populations. They would also disperse deer and so help prevent overgrazing of forests. What could be our objections? There are many who do not support wolf or bear reintroduction, but who do believe that the lynx would be a much easier and less challenging animal to live alongside. The reality is that these predators are shy, and most people walking through their territories would never see them. Just imagine how it would feel to walk amongst hills and forests, knowing that these charismatic animals were there, to be in the presence of such powerful and beautiful creatures, safe in the knowledge that they are more likely to run away than come anywhere near us. Is there anywhere that could support lynx? Although Britain is a crowded island, the Scottish Highlands is one of the wildest and least populated areas of Europe, and there is evidence to show that it could support lynx and even the more controversial wolf. The wolf has been feared for millennia, until it was finally wiped out around 260 years ago. It suffered hugely from the unfounded superstitions that built up around it. But in reality, this is a shy and intelligent animal, and its sinister fairy tale image is undeserved. We now know that the threat to humans from wolves is minuscule. In the past 50 years, there have only been 17 fatal attacks on humans in the whole of Europe, Russia and North America. Domestic dogs, and even horses, are statistically far more dangerous to humans. We can't avoid risk, but we humans are fickle and often like to choose some risks over others. We also know that there is enough prey and habitat for wolves, at least in Scotland. There is real concern that they might prey on sheep and dogs, but we can learn lessons from other countries that live alongside these animals. Techniques for protecting livestock and dogs, as well as compensation schemes for their loss, have been used in other parts of Europe and the United States. Would Britons be willing to adopt such schemes? Could we make them work here? If so, we could reap the benefits of wolf tourism, as is now the case in the United States of America. In Yellowstone National Park, where wolves have been reintroduced, thousands of visitors come every year for the opportunity to hear wolves howling, and if they're lucky, to catch a glimpse of these shy and elusive animals. But perhaps the wolf's absence for 260 years in Britain has been too long. Of all our missing predators, the bear is the one that presents the biggest challenge. At present, we do not have enough habitat for bears, but perhaps our descendants may one day consider its return. The bear is the only top predator that could pose any significant threat to human safety. Would future generations be prepared to learn ways of avoiding conflict, knowledge that is taken for granted in parts of Europe and the United States? Only time will tell.
With limited resources available for conservation, some suggest it is best to channel money into protecting existing species. But there is strong evidence to suggest that the return of predators could help restore balance to the countryside. The high deer numbers in Scotland have a devastating effect on woodland and other habitats. Predators could help to manage this problem, allowing wild forests to regenerate. And the reality is that even some of the wilder parts of England and Wales have habitats suitable for the lynx. The EU Habitats Directive requires Member States to investigate the feasibility of reintroducing certain missing species that have been wiped out by humans. This doesn't mean we have to actually reintroduce them, simply to investigate the possibility. We may have strong views for or against reintroductions, but we can never be sure our views are correct if not backed up by a scientific trial. Is it fair to ask people in other countries to live alongside and protect tigers, for example, if we refuse to live with top predators ourselves? Would we have a bit more credibility if we did share our island with wolves or lynx? To consider bringing back our missing predators is controversial, and however we feel about our ancestors' decision to remove them from wild Britain, it is we modern Britons who will make the choice whether or not they return. And the inescapable truth is, our ancestors acted out of ignorance and fear when they removed the top predators from our landscapes. But we are much better informed. And just imagine the respect with which our descendants will regard us if our legacy to them is the restoration of our wild places, complete with the lynx, the wolf, and perhaps even the bear. Just imagine. The great wood of Caledon that once existed throughout Scotland has been lost through the Industrial Revolution, two world wars, fighting the Spanish in the Armada, and now we've got 1% left. And that's really what's driven me and motivated me to do what I'm doing. My sole objective is to create a controlled fence to reserve of a minimum of 50,000 acres where we can restore large carnivals back into the area to manage the deer numbers and become an alternative to a, a traditional sporting estate. I was hired to reintroduce wolves to Yellowstone National Park and in essence restore their ecological function to the park. There was a lot of fear, there was, you know, it was the unknown and what people knew is they killed them off and why'd they kill them off? Because they were a problem. What'd they do? Well they killed livestock and they competed with us for elk and deer and we like to be the primary carnivore people and so wolves are just kind of a nuisance they're in the way so we got rid of them. You get calls at all times of the day. You get calls every day of the week. Sometimes they call just to harass. You, you, you can't lose it yourself. You've got to maintain control. Have I been threatened? Yes, many times. Outrage in the press because things, you know, there's, it, it seems like nobody's ever happy. And, and I am squarely in the middle. Really, it wasn't that hard biologically. It was really hard sociologically, but coincident with these carnivore increases, you get this kind of response that benefits a whole wide circle of, of animal. I don't know if you can hear it because of the stream, but I'm listening to three, four different species of songbirds. And these songbirds have increased as this willow's increased. 
elk changed Yellowstone. Wolves are slowly, they haven't done this yet, changing it back. Wolves bring the wild right back in front of you. They have a certain aura and presence about them that we just don't get in everyday life. That's had a huge economic impact for wildlife tourism in the Yellowstone area. $35 million per year to communities that are next to Yellowstone. It's some of the best time in Yellowstone's history, actually. Well, we just really celebrated 10 years now at Aladell, and uh, we've really focused very much on, on the landscape restoration in regards to reforestation. Planted something in excess of 800,000 trees, many different species. We've restored our peatlands, and on top of that, we've now brought back red squirrels to an area of Scotland that haven't been seen for, for decades. It's not common knowledge that just 3% of global philanthropy goes to the environment, which is basically air, water, and soil three vital things on which we depend. Unless we see that imbalance adjusted, we're heading for a brick wall. I think it's about time that we worked out that we share this planet with other species. We can't survive here alone. The Western Ada runs through the Nepa State in West Sussex. This is now at the heart of the largest rewilding project in lowland England. It's based on a naturalistic organic grazing system using free roaming ponies, cattle, pigs and deer. Much of the river was canalised in the 19th century. The challenge was to return the river to its floodplain, allowing dynamic natural processes to return. The Ada is created from surface water, which means that here, in the upper reaches, it can slow to a trickle in the summer, but in winter, with saturated clay soils and heavy rainfall, it can swell to huge volumes. Draining the land for agriculture has increased the speed that the water runs off the land. Our aim has been to reverse this process, slowing the water down and allowing it to stay on the land for longer, as it used to, and to create a myriad of water habitats. We began by simply filling in the old canals just behind me and returning the river to the, its old meanders which you could see across the floodplain. And there we created channels for both summer and winter flow. A gang of volunteers put in woody debris blockages to create complexity and new sediment pathways. This has created a range of new aquatic habitats like eddies and pools and riffles, as well as submerged and exposed sediment bars. It's been an incredibly dry spring with very little rainfall, but normally these woody debris blockages trap sediment and twigs and other organic matter. And this allows oxygenation, which in turn improves the water quality. In effect, we've been behaving exactly like beavers. We've created 25 hectares of scrapes. Some of them hold water all year round, others dry up entirely in the summer. And this has created a range of important habitats for aquatic plants, invertebrates, and for wintering and breeding birds. Our grazing animals also interact with these watery habitats, puddling, grazing, softening the margins, providing pools of warm, shallow water for invertebrates. Sometimes they surprise us with their ingenuity. Our pigs love diving for swan mussels and are often seen behaving like hippos. Where the footpath crossed the floodplain, we created this causeway. And nearby, a couple of tree platforms, which are now fantastic vantage points for viewing wildlife. We also took out four weirs and modified another to allow easier passage for fish. In the first month, we counted six sea trout running over the Hammer Pond spillway. But this isn't a project in isolation. It's part of a much larger holistic view of hydrology. 
We've also filled in ditches and broken drainage systems and created scrapes and restored water systems throughout the entire rewilding project. We're interested in the entire water cycle, from the moment it falls as raindrops on the land, filtering through vegetation, through the soil, passing into brooks and streams, and finally into the Ada itself as it heads towards the sea.